years, uh, biologists said, you know, that, oh, you know, animals, we're not animals. And, or maybe we are, but we're super special. And, you, you know, you can't uh, anthropomorphize. Um, uh, so, guys, I'm just getting a notice here that I have an internet connection issue, but uh, please let me know if you're having problems with my um, with the audio, and please shut off your camera, please, if you're if they're on. Thanks, that'll help with fun. So, you know, not to anthropomorphize. So, I mean, why not? You know, it was said that, uh, you know, back in the, the, the uh, old school way of thinking that, you know, animals don't feel this kind of uh, emotion, they don't grieve, and now we know that that's, that's really not, not true. So it was, uh, animals don't play. And again, in the past, it was just animals. They didn't say other animals because we weren't uh, really in the, in the, in the same uh, club, if you will. You know, oh, it's ridiculous. Actually, some of the things that biologists uh, came up with to justify the kind of behaviors, you know, you see on the screen here is uh, uh, young animals are jumping up and down to, uh, to shake off external parasites, <laughs> you know, just things that had no basis in, in reality. I had no empirical evidence for this, but they couldn't believe that animals played and had fun. Oh, come on. Okay. But eventually they said, okay, mammals play, but um, there's good reason for it. It serves a purpose. It's you know, utilitarian play. So it, it was uh, once thought that juvenile pretend hunting makes them better hunters as adults. It would just assume that. And there was a long time before uh, someone thought of doing a, a novel procedure called research. And the research showed that no, uh, you know, juveniles that are, that engage more in pretend hunting or engage uh, or are better, uh, you know, in the play hunting sort of uh, behaviors are, they're not better hunters, no. Okay, well, youngsters play fighting, you know, helps them to be, you know, tougher or survive attacks or more likely to attract mates or something like that. And again, there was this, uh, finally someone did, you know, actual research observation. And no, that's actually not true either. Well, you know, so there, there's a lot of folks that are still clinging to this idea that animals are, you know, they're not out to have fun. That's only us. And, and we shouldn't have too much of it either. There must be good reasons to have fun because, yeah, playing is expensive. It is very energy intensive. And also, yeah, there's a there's a, a high, you know, cost of life to it. And I was surprised to learn that 80% of all sea lion pups die while playing. And they don't play in traffic necessarily, but you know, I guess when you're playing, you're not paying attention to what predators or to other uh, other dangers, I suppose. Um, but again, this old, old idea, the old school idea, was obviously it has evolutionary advantages. Or this wouldn't be happening. You know, it's it's again, it's utilitarian. No, baloney. Sorry, it's a, that's not true. You know, for example, gulls just want to have fun. Um, so there's some interesting seagull studies where they do this uh, drop catch game. So everyone knows that uh, gulls of various kinds, you know, herring gulls, ringo gulls. So they'll they'll pick up something, let's say a, a mussel, drop it to open it up, zoom down and eat it. Fine, that works great. But they play with objects that are not food, um, sticks, a lot of plastic garbage, uh, and they, they are more apt to play this drop catch the windier it is. In other words, the more challenging or the more fun it is, uh, the more they are apt to do this kind of thing. Again, some behaviorists uh, might say, oh, it's, it's practice, or et cetera. You know, that, that, I, there's nothing to support that. They go, just want to have fun. It's, it's, Song, I think. I don't know. Uh, corgis. I apologize. These are terrible pictures. I realize um, I really, these are from videos. And if you uh, want to go on the internet afterwards and look at, uh, you know, snow surfing. Uh, so uh, these are hooded crows in, in uh, Russia. And if you look at the, the image on the right, there's this, this round object there. That is a plastic lid that this thing has found to use as a toboggan. Fly up to the top of the roof, toboggan down. Fly up, toboggan down. Um, ravens are uh, renowned for doing this now um, in uh, Alaska, the Northwest Territories. They typically will find a stick. They'll, they'll choose a stick as a snowboard and they'll get up and, and just repeatedly, you know, snowboard down roofs. 
uh, I, you know, again, there's some really fun studies. I had a, a you know a great time looking some of this stuff up. I get too far down the rabbit hole actually, which is a problem. But um, so, and again, there the uh, researchers would say, "Oh, we can see no utilitarian uh, explanation for this behavior," but, but it was fun to watch. So it's like, oh, finally a concession. Okay, fine, not just mammals uh, play, but only warm-blooded animals. Okay, fine. Oh, sorry, baloney is what they is what they mean. That's not uh, that's not true. So crocodiles surfing. Uh, this is a very well documented phenomenon. And again, uh, the, uh, the internet is replete with uh, videos of this kind of thing. In fact, some actual human surfers getting content with crocodiles, but a while. Um, but okay, so here's the, you know, we have reptiles playing croquet, croquet or something, you know, and so they, you know, there's just a propensity to play. Uh, so you have uh, octopuses or octopodes, I'm told, is proper plural. <laughs> Um, so one of the things that um, octopuses do in aquariums are, is a uh, spit soccer. So, you know, if there's uh, something floating on the surface, uh, you know, like a plastic object, they will uh, spit uh, to move it back and forth from one end of the aquarium to the other. Uh, interesting. Um, so as you guys probably know, you know, octopuses have been uh, noted using tools. Uh, they build shelters underwater and do water sort of uh, little, little caverns uh, out of coconut shells uh, in which to hide, you know, hide from predators, but also uh, as a sort of a blind for, uh, for hunting. Um, you know, I'm real happy to hear that uh, octopuses know how to use, use uh, tools now because um, if I need drywall done in the house, on the yeah, the thing must be the best, I would guess. Um, so, Geckos uh, play. Um, in 2014, 2013, uh, all my notes are in the uh, slideshow, but I can't see. <laughs> I can't see. Uh, so there are the Russians sent up five geckos into space. Uh, let's see, four males and a female, I believe. And they, believe it or not, the purpose was to uh, observe weightless gecko sex. <laughs> So if you thought only in America there's a uh, questionable uh, science being funded, you know, who knows what might have come out of this? I know they actually ended up losing control uh, of this uh, little module that they got. But while they still had uh, contact with it, these geckos were more interested in playing uh, in a weightless environment. And a few things had gotten loose inside this little module, uh, a couple of collars that were supposed to be on them. And they would, they would you know, uh, of course, they can stick to the uh, to a surface with their uh, paws. That's not with their feet, their uh, with their toes. Uh, but they would bounce off a surface and, and bat these things around the, the capsules. So they, I, I don't know if they ever got around to having sex. I didn't read that part. Um, didn't get that part in there. But again, it was they were obviously having some kind of you know some kind of fun. Um, monitors are one of the lizards that uh, also can be playful. They're really good part of the uh, like, uh, monitor games is you don't need an empire because of monitor, right? Sorry. Uh, this this was a, a really interesting phenomenon that I came across and it is apparently pretty common, uh, not just on a muddy hillside, but uh, on grassy slopes or elephants, uh, young and adults, uh, they just clamber up to the top and repeatedly slide down. Uh, you know, and I've read accounts from researchers that do this, there's a massive pile up at the bottom and, you know, what do you think they're doing? Uh, they're rubbing off external parasites. Obviously, no, they're, they're playing. It, it, you know, it's it, it's innate. It's in it's so many animals. Uh, we have no idea, and yet it's uh, impossible to know, I suppose, uh, how far this goes, you know, how, how far into the animal kingdom this goes. And sex, I don't know. <laughs> it, it's not, uh, not out of the realm of possibility. Sea lions are known to be very playful. Of course, probably have a different take on it now that you know that 80% of them perish playing. Um, otters, I'm sure a lot of folks in uh, northern New York have seen you know, otter slides in the wintertime when they're hiking. I've seen this along the uh, Racket River Stone Valley Trail. 
Incidentally, I didn't mention I'm uh, broadcasting, as it were. I'm coming to you from uh, Valley Mall, Quebec, where I uh, now live. So I haven't been on the Stone Valley Trail in a few years. So meerkats. Um, so these guys are a type of mongoose uh, in Africa. Uh, and they're very, very playful. They just, they just, all the time, they're really renowned for that. In fact, they, they, they're so adept at playing that, um, as you can see here, well, they're unusual. So uh, there was a, a five-year meerkat play study done, uh, and this is Linda Sharp, uh, Linda with a Y, and she wrote an article in Scientific American. Again, it's in my notes, and I'm trying to think well, what year it was there. Uh, I want to say 2011, uh, but if you want to look that up, so Linda Sharp, uh, she's an excellent writer. It's a hilarious article, which is really fun to read. Uh, but she talks about animal play in general, and it focuses a lot of it's on the meerkat uh, study. Um, and again, she's one of the researchers who found out that, uh, yeah, this, you know, play hunting, baloney, it doesn't make, you know, make a better hunter than that. You know, the, the, the winner of play uh, fights, the extremes of fierce that can play, they don't get the mate. You know, they don't, so, it, yeah. Um, but she, uh, she's rather honest for, for a scientist. And she says, I have no idea why they play <laughs> five years and no answers. So, um, yeah. And that's the, that's really the case with the, you know, with a lot of science, isn't it? We just have no idea. We just are embarrassed to say this. Uh, I'm, I'm right in there uh, with, you know, with that cohort that are embarrassed. You know, we still don't really explain maple sap entirely. Uh, we definitely haven't explained all well, leaf color entirely. You know, there's so many simple, you know, seemingly simple things. So, all right, I have no idea why meerkats play, but she did document that it seems to help because the juveniles, which were more apt to play, were better parents. They had more kits surviving per litter. They seem to be more attentive parents. So we know that there's some kind of connection there that's playing, you know, there's a purpose to it, but it's not utilitarian. It, it's, uh, yeah, it's helpful. Um, so this gentleman, uh, Max Kearney, he's a researcher in the, in the UK. Um, also a really interesting study. He's done a lot of animal behavior studies. If you uh, look up his name. So he's just saying, yeah, studies of uh, squirrels, wild horses, bears. The amount of time animals spend playing as juveniles does seem to have an important effect on their long-term survival and reproductive success. So he's honest as well. Exactly how play achieves this is not obvious. But empirically, it's true. Playing is really good for us. And not just as juveniles. Uh, it certainly shows uh, what, what happens. There's this uh, object in the um, in our skulls there. That, I can't think of the word there, the brain. That's... So, uh, all right, here's Max Kearney again. A close relationship between the amount animal play and the size of the neocortex, cerebellum, amygdala, etc. So, there you go. All work and no play makes death dull at the same uh, same length. Goes. So it is true. And it's important to have playmates. So when a, a, an individual rat is raised in a, just the most diverse habitat with the, the most, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of, um, you know, uh, stimuli, but deprived of play uh, with another of its species, its brain does not develop fully. I suppose with rats, maybe they you know, mind so much, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so others, we, we're already into this, uh, we're overlapping between, you know, the need for play and the need for company. That's interesting. So unfortunately, there's some negative attitudes, I think, in our culture towards play. And I, you know, maybe it's the uh, sort of Puritan or, you know, a Protestant work ethic. You know, the playing is an extravagance, uh, idle hands are the devil's playmates, etc. cetera. Um, you know, and that, that is kind of pervasive. You should be busy all the time. Um, one of the really sad uh, but most common phrases I hear from other men when we uh, connect after that, after having seen each other in a while. Are you keeping busy? Well, I hope not. I mean, 
you know, as someone who's a, a writer, you know, my, my best ideas come when I'm definitely not busy. I mean, it's fun to be busy. Yes, I like work, uh, but keeping busy is a, is a really bad hobby. Does all work and no play really make Jill or Jack Bell? Yep. But by golly, it will build character. Uh, that boy looks like he's probably going to have more character than he needs. So, so we could ask, is this a, a luxury or a necessity? Well, I'd say it's, it's really both. You could say in a sense that it's a luxury. Um, because if we're deprived of some, some basic, basic... Uh, uh, needs, you know, if, if we're, if we're malnourished, you know, we're uh, hypothermic, you know, but you know, you know, we don't have proper shelter, we don't have proper uh, food or clothing, then yeah, you know, playing will create a range of activities, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you can check me on this, but I think Somalia and the U.S. are the only countries which have not ratified this uh, convention. I guess maybe that's a pure and work, work ethic. It doesn't apply in Somalia. Okay, um, so what about happiness? Our happiness and the other animals' happiness? You know, is it conditional? A and again, it goes back to, you know, circumstances. If you're malnourished, it's hard to be very happy. Um, so, you know, the basic uh, necessities of life really do need to be provided uh, for, for one to be, you know, relatively happy. Uh, I mean, if you're properly nourished and you have a, you know, you have community and, you know, you, you have family, you're surrounded, uh, you know, in, in this way. And, you know, certainly there can be happiness, but, um, so, you know, there's plenty of sociological studies that indicate that happiness, um, you know, or the, the sense, the perception of happiness rises as income rises, but only, only to a degree. And that's really interesting. So conditional, you'd be happy as a pig in an orchard. As I say, happy as a pig in a peach orchard. It's uh, the same thing. There's a lot of animal sort of uh, aphorisms and similes out there. You know, happy as a puck with two tails, as a monkey with a peanut machine, as a whatever. So if you're happy as a pig in an orchard, but yeah, a pig wouldn't be happy right then, I suppose. So there's conditional happiness in that saying. So happy as a clam, you can tell it's smiling, it's obvious. Um, but then at low tide, they're not happy either. So there's a, you know, there's a conditionality to that same as well. So what are our needs? Survival. You know, again, food, water, shelter, safety, safety, freedom from violence. That's pretty important. We have a happiness barrier that uh, would seem to be peculiar to us. So it's pretty obvious, uh, self-evident, the state of poverty. Uh, can, can sort of put a damper on happiness. Turns out wealth does too. Above approximately 80,000 US, additional income reduces this, a sense of life satisfaction. Not to say you're not happy to have that extra money or glad to have it or something like that, but the reported sense of life satisfaction decreases steadily as income rises above a certain level. That is really interesting. And on the other hand, there is good research to show that when you give, happiness goes up. Um, so we're, you know, how do we know when someone's happy? Well, cortisol levels, you know, when there's a sociological study, you know, blood pressure, cortisol levels, and uh, other markers and such as that. So what are our other needs? We have social needs, belonging, bonding, uh, and further on, uh, you know, the need for uh, esteem, self-esteem or for esteem in a community, the need for creative expression. And really by definition, those are also uh, a social need because they, they occur in a social context. So here we are, you know, talking about, you know, when you're kind of uh, transi transitioning from play uh, to, you know, what, what is happiness and, you know, what is, uh, you know, what does it mean to be together and to be social? Uh, and, and it really all, all is a, a, a one cloth. Uh, we do need each other. We do. You know, in these times of the uh, you know, COVID lockdown and so on, um, it's really challenging. It's really challenging. It's, it's, uh, one of the reasons Heidi wouldn't let me, you know, make you all feel depressed at the end of the, the, end of the slideshow. Um, you know, even though there's plenty of bad news to share. Um, 
So uh, living in Canada, I still have to go to the United States once in a while, and boy, are they strict about the uh, mandatory self-isolation. They email, Health Canada emails, they phone. Uh, and so I really, when I come back from the, from the U.S., in the times I've gone, um, it is kind of, you know, it gets a little discouraging towards the end of those 14 days. I mean, okay, I go outdoors, but uh, I, I actually feel really self-conscious, um, you know, talking to, talking to somebody, talking to the neighbor. We don't have a lot of neighbors. It's quite rural here, but, but still, you know, I, you feel that sense of loneliness. So anyone who's, uh, you know, taken a basic, you know, socio sociology course, knows Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So, you know, on the, on the bottom there's the basics, you know, safety, the need for love and belonging, esteem, and, uh, you know, creative expression self-actualization. So how do we tell if a creature is happy? Yeah, this is where we go back to, to anthropomorphizing. Oh, you can't tell if a dog or cat is happy. I think you guys, pet owners know if your animals are, are happy or sad. Um, you know, maybe the, the smiles aren't the same, but you know, you can tell the body language. And and again, years ago, this was this was just dismissed. With, uh, you know, with no again, no research, no evidence uh, that we should dismiss it. Uh, no, these animals aren't happy. But okay, so how do we tell if they're pretty happy? Uh, you know, measure blood pressure. Uh, you know, blood cortisol or saliva cortisol test. Um, you know, one of the really more uh, um, you know interesting parameters or ways of measuring you know, happiness and, and emotion are, you know, real-time brain imaging. So uh, MRI on the left and the positron emission tomography on the right or, or PET. Um, so, you know, you can really look at the, it. And so some of these studies that are done, um, it, it's, it's fascinating because the self-reporting of, you know, how you feel, you know, you, your, your sense of happiness and the brain scans really, really line up. So people seem to be pretty honest when they're saying whether they, you know, feel satisfied with their life or not. It's easy to tell when folks are unhappy, when critters are unhappy. So just look at these guys. Yeah, that's pretty discouraging. Um, so if you notice, well, the, the sort of common factor in all of these photos, what? They're alone. Yeah, so, um, being in prison probably is, is no fun, I imagine. I haven't Ever happened to me, please God. Um, but yeah, but being alone, um, it even worse. So no one likes a lockdown. You know, this, this, this corona lockdown, keep off the streets and so on. Um, they have been issuing, you know, fines in, in Quebec and Gatineau uh, you know, for having a house party with five people. So, um, yeah, again, it has, it has been challenging. Uh, this was in the news quite a bit. In, uh, in 2018, early 2018, loneliness may be a greater human health risk than obesity and smoking combined. So that was a uh, really interesting revelation. So smoking, yeah, okay, pack, pack of cigarettes, what do you do for smoking too? Um, and we know that most species are social. So, all right, the canine, sure, dogs, wolves, whatever, packs, uh, deer, you know, um, cervid, you know, anything in the, in the deer family. Uh, certainly, you know, dolphins, um, manatees, are, are um, aquatic mammals, elephants. You know, again, uh, it's very well uh, well documented and uh, widely known that how, how social elephants are, how they mourn the loss or the death of uh, uh, one of the members of, of their group. Uh, orcas, they're the forward at the beginning. Bees, of course, we know bees are social. Not all, actually, all bees aren't social, strictly speaking, but you know, so our, our honeybees, bumblebees, uh, wasps, and, okay, wasps are social within their group, that's what I mean. They're not really social when you're bothered by that, to admit, kind of anti-social. Um, ants are very social, and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, at, at the end here, uh, maybe direct you to a couple of uh, articles. There are three articles that sort of tie into this, and um, one of the, uh, I cite a study on ants, and Ants that don't have enough social contact, they stop digesting properly. And there's no physiological explanation for this. There's no, oh, you know, they, they pick up microbes from the other ones or something. <clears throat> no, they, they just, they, they pace back and forth. So they pace uh, needlessly or aimlessly and they stop digesting. <clears throat> 
So really interesting. Even cells, it turns out that cells prefer company. Right? Yeah. That's weird, like in a petri dish. So yeah, penguins, cattle, squid. Squid are so so. Who knew? I didn't know that. And humans too. So yeah. In fact, in 2008, in Switzerland, the government made it a federal crime to isolate social animals. It's a, it's a, it's a, well, think about that in the context that I don't know how they're doing with this, with this whole COVID lockdown in Switzerland. I don't know who's been arrested for isolating. Somebody. I, you know, that's, that could be complicated. But, I mean, it, it does make you think because here we are, uh, and I, you know, sort of, uh, this may seem like a digression, but I think it fits right in, um, you know, with the topic here. So according to Amnesty International, prolonged solitary confinement is a violation of international law. Uh, if, uh, it turns out that if the U.S. has more people in solitary than any other country in the world, I mean, average stay is eight years, eight years in solitary, eight years. So remember that picture of those animals? They're all sad. And, uh, uh, nearly everyone that's in prison, just remember, is getting out. You know, that. It, you know, the, the percentage that are in there, like, for their life, it's, it's minority. We want people to be happy, adjusted, better. Um, and we, you know, it, we, this, uh, this uh, practice, really. So, again, this, in Switzerland, this would be a federal crime to put someone in solitary confinement. So, I really think it does behoove us to, to reach out. So, what do we, you know, how can we respond to this uh, situation here? So remember the part where you know you know donating money it makes us you know it increases our subjective happiness uh, and, and then again yeah ob objectively you know cortisol drops blood pressure drops that kind of thing so you know you know giving is important so the old adage you know better to give than to receive it's good to do both if you just insist on being a giver you know that's kind of controlling and maybe a little pathological you know you give and you, and you receive. Uh, you know, so there's gifts of time, there's, there's gifts of talent. Uh, you, know, you make up a story for someone, you know, draw a picture, uh, but it makes us feel better. Uh, it makes everyone feel better. Uh, so, and also for asking for your needs to be met, asking for, you know, for company. Come over and have a, a cup of tea with me uh, six meters away from me. Uh, when you're ask for something it seems like oh i don't want to bother somebody i don't want to bother you guess what when you ask it gives the other person the opportunity to give uh, i once read a definition of true poverty is having the opportunity uh the opportunity to give stripped away from you that's real poverty if you're not you're not able to, to give back it's an important point so um, you know, the giving and the, the, the asking, you know, they all go together. And I really think this is, a, this is a great time to practice, you know, better community as challenging uh, as it is. I would say it'd be a great time to think about uh, you know, what I mentioned in terms of solitary confinement. You know, you know, write to someone about this or, you know, in the future, do what you can to uh, uh, help this get changed, perhaps. And so, yeah, let's all please be kind to each other and to ourselves. So, yeah, we, we are all in it together. Is a cliche, but you know, it's it's, uh, it's true as well. So, that it turns out is it for the slideshow here. And let's see, I've gone 40 minutes, a little less than I had anticipated, but uh, I would love to. Have any answer any questions if I can? Um, I see if there are any in the chat box. Ah, oh, thanks for putting the, the studies up there. That's great. That's great. And uh, hi to folks from Tennessee and California. Hey, I, I, it, it hadn't even occurred to me 
about what this isolation is doing. You know, you think a lot about it, especially at our ages, but this really brings it to mind that all these people that are alone, we're lucky we have each other. It must be really horrible on them if you think of it from an animal point of view. You know, uh, so it, it's, right. it's very valuable what you were saying. It, it really hit me home in a different way. Right. Oh, thanks for, for you know, mentioning that. Yeah, we have this biological need. It's not just, oh, it's nice for company. This is encoded in our DNA. You know, we're, we're a social species. So, um, and again, that, that little part at the end, I, you know, I, I felt a little funny, you know, funny saying, oh, you know, this, you know, fuzzy, lovey-dovey sort of stuff. But yeah, you know, we need to reach out both ways. You know, ask, hey, come over. Or, hey, um, you know, can I come over? Carefully. And so on. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Well, you, you're welcome to ask me questions about other things too. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not an authority on animal behavior, but uh, you know, trees, bugs. I don't know. I answer questions for free. Correct answers are five dollars. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, also, um, I suppose you could. I could. Yeah. So, I mean, you want to share my email, and if folks you know, have questions on nature or observations or anything, uh, comments or criticisms too, that's fine. Uh, you're welcome to email me. And, and the book. I mean, I'm not trying to hawk the book tremendously. Uh, it turned out I had to republish it because the publisher um, went bankrupt during this um, COVID situation. So uh, there's, there's a brand new link and I, I did put it in the chat box. You know, there are lots of ways of being social. And one of the ways we're doing is doing a lot of reading, travel memoirs and things. But for society that doesn't read like they used to, they don't seem to know how to get this social interaction other than through physical contact. Like we're finding it through really good videos or DVDs. And like I said, through a lot of the readings that are just pleasant and getting to know people and what they're experiencing. But so many people don't read anymore. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, that's true. So um, I, you guys may, may have seen in the chat box there, uh, Kat says as a, as a wildlife rehabilitator, uh, we find orphans die much more often when raised singly than with uh, siblings, uh, even adopted siblings. So, thank you. Yeah. Just brings it home. Oh, cool. Hey, oh, Paul. Uh, uh, Wiley, Wiley here. Uh, so, s since we're well under our time of, of an hour, I'll ask you, uh, how did you... Uh, what stimulated your interest in in studying uh, becoming a naturalist and in, in, in studying animal interactions and and, and whatnot? Uh, just uh, I'm interested in what uh, kind of cued you into into this uh, this field and profession. Right. Well, thanks for the question, Wiley. Um, I would say that my really you know introduction to the natural world was was uh, trees. You know, so I became an arborist. I uh, you know, you could say it's all accidental. I mean, I didn't have any, you know, great plan. Oh, you know, um, it's just uh, I really uh, I feel I know how much how much better I feel when I have uh, you know contact with the natural world. It really that's a huge need for me. Uh, before moving to Quebec here, I, I was in Ottawa in an apartment. And, uh, it was just it was literally killing me. My wife knows this. She's she would have been okay there to, to stay, but you know she, she made a sacrifice really of. Uh, do what it took to, to move out and, and you know to nature so I you know I knew how important that was I'd like to know a little bit about it so I, I got into trees and tree work arboriculture uh, and then from there into uh, medicinal herbs so I was really interested in then you know edible plants so it just kind of uh, progressed a little bit naturally and I'm, I'm pretty much self-taught I mean I did go to Paul Smith's college but not for forestry you know, for ecology um, and yeah and then my job I had Cornell Cooperative Extension. So I, I've, I've been with them on different uh, funding sources since 2000, on and off. But then since 2011, I, I took a permanent uh, position there, um, and I just left at the end of 2019, or near the end of the fall. So 
because of my job, I, I kind of was forced to learn more. You know, and, um, and, and it was great. I, I think it's uh, it's great. It's important to be on a learning curve. You know, they're talking about the you know, reading and stuff like that. So I don't think I'm a very good naturalist, Wiley. <laughs> to be quite honest, but, you know, and that's not a you know I think that's a fair criticism. You know, I'm a, I'm an okay naturalist. Uh, I have you know some tremendous interest uh, that that's uh, you know in in certain quarters and uh, yeah maybe bit of an authority there or, or you know good there but you know not the most observant guy in the world but I, I love learning I love learning and you know as much as I maybe know about trees anytime I, I lead a tree walk or you know a nature walk I learn so much you know there's always someone that has something oh that angle or this you know this old piece of this old nugget of folk wisdom or something like that so um yeah I, I think we should all call ourselves naturalists you know and, yeah, it's a real, real pleasure, and it's humbling to, to, to learn more. Yeah. yeah so, um, Tom uh, had a uh, question in the chat box. Let's see. Okay, a couple things in the chat box. So Tom is saying, um, uh, what uh, any uh, any. Uh, progress in terms of the jumping worm invasion and this is one of the things that I maybe was going to present to make y'all feel worse at the end. Uh, so we have some, you know an Asian uh, jumping worm complex you know there's a, a, a Memphis uh, and uh, well, Metafire. Memphis and Metafire are the, are the two genera of jumping worms and these guys are just bad news for you know if they're in your garden it's not good but you can manage it by, by adding um, organic matter. So it's really not good for forest ecosystems. Um, I think you say, uh, Tom, the, the wording was, you know, uh, any luck of uh, fighting. We're not to the stage of fighting yet. I'm really just trying to raise awareness. Uh, in fact, you know, just just a few, few, few foresters in Canada are finally, you know, getting interested in it because I keep shutting it down people's throats here. <laughs> how, to, how to make friends. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you know, it's just something, it, and some of these things that, that are scary and you know potentially very harmful. It's good to know about them so that you can, uh, you know, because this uh, early uh, detection and rapid response is really really critical. You know, in terms of at least containing uh, you know uh, outbreaks. So there are jumping worms in you know pretty much every county in New York State if they're in uh, Old Forge, for example. So, you know, they're in, uh, you know, Warrensburg, Grover Lake, I, you know, there are reports from, from every uh, every quarter, you, you know, even some high elevations that are at around that, so really tough, tough uh, critters. So, yeah, just spread the word and yeah, do what you can. So, um, uh, another question about, a, 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 okay, so I got some messages privately. So, uh, a favorite tick removal tool. Um, uh, so yeah, oh thanks Chris for the comment. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and you're very welcome. So uh, I I don't really I think that those uh, the little tools that, that look like a, a something you pry out a nail with, you know, like a, a little uh, and honestly at, at every hardware store or whatever they're they're near the checkout and stuff. Um, yeah, I think folks should have those in their, their purses and tackle box and glove compartment and everything else. I think they seem to work well. The CDC insists, the Center for Disease Control insists that, you know, a fine nose, um, uh, sorry, tweezer, you know, forceps is really what is the best thing and pull it straight out, et cetera. Uh, I, I think it's important just to get them out. Uh, I want to mention too and emphasize that 99% of the time, there's going to be some tick parts left in your skin. This is not a problem. I mean, oh, okay, there's possible there's a you know, localized infection or something, put some ointment on or what have you, but yeah, it does not increase your, your chances of, of uh, likelihood of, of getting Lyme or other tick-borne illness. And, and it's not a reason to visit the doctor. So you're, you're, you're okay with that. Uh, but I do carry tweezers and a magnifying glass in the car. And it's just a really good thing to have. Uh, you know, Lyme messed up my life for, for a couple of years and I, I have I'm a lot more friendly toward Promethea now, let's just say that. <laughs> I remember the person that would uh, mess around with chemicals, but yeah. Anyways, voila, uh, let's 
see uh, something else here. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, someone from Ontario, cool. Uh, graduate from the program, sexual oversaturated and underfunded. Okay, so um, you're welcome, um, uh, Abby. Yeah, you're welcome to email me if you'd like, uh, Abby, and you know I could uh, answer a little bit more at, at length. Um, skill set or quality? Yeah, that's so. I'm looking for that too, actually. Uh, I um, I had contacts here in uh, in Canada uh, from working with Cornell. Uh, many of the programs that we would put on through Cornell in Northern New York were of great interest to foresters in Canada because the uh, invasive forest pests are, are moving northward. So, you know, I had some friends, I had some contacts, and I had a few uh, reasonable job prospects. And now with the COVID, that all that all just dried up. So, I make a little money off my writing. I write for National Public Radio, and they're kind enough to pay me. So, hey, support those guys. Um, yeah, just email me and be happy to share some, some more thoughts there. Um, and thanks for the comment. And let's see, two new messages. Yeah, no, just uh, no further questions. So um, I'm sorry if someone was, was hoping for some a way to use up an entire hour. Uh, I really thought it was, uh, I was afraid of running too long, uh, to tell you the truth. But uh, there you have it. Probably talked too fast because I was nervous. I was nervous because our internet connection here is, is and it's very rural and it sometimes just freezes, the, the audio preps out, so there you go. So it's a wonderful topic and a wonderful presentation. We enjoyed it very much, Paul, so thank you. Thank you. Um, and we hope to have you back again um, when we can do this in person <laughs> sometime be, soon, hopefully, there. and we, we can all socialize. <laughs> Yes, yes. And have some could fun, I, too. <laughs> could I add one comment? Sure. Is that Sandy? Yeah. Yes. My question is, as a land trust, how could we use some of your thoughts and ideas to help um, people enjoy the land around us and, and the animals and life? And how, Are there ways we could use some of your thoughts to, to do some of that? Uh, okay, I, I'm not entirely sure uh, exactly what you're asking. Um, could, uh, yeah, the thoughts, you know, relative to the, the presentation or, or my thoughts just in general? Well, in general, I, basically thinking about we're, we have a lot of land, we have trails, we have a lot of different things, pro programs going on, but how are there some ideas you might have that would get people to feel better, to feel more connected. Um, okay, right, I see. Well, I mean, more of the same. I, you know, I think you guys do a great job uh, with programming. And, you know, um, getting outdoors is, um, you know, really healing. And, you know, one of the nice things is there's a, that the, uh, COVID transmission apparently is much lower outdoors than it is in, in an enclosed space. So, you know, just, I don't have anything brilliant to add other than, you know, more of the same. You know, again, <laughs> if, uh, if it's at all, you know, feasible, I'm, I'm lucky because I have status here in Canada as a permanent resident and I'm a U.S. citizen, so I can go both ways. You know, I, you know, I'd be happy to come down and do a trail walk or something like that. But, you know, I think empowering, uh, each other or feeling empowered uh, to, to just do anything you think that, you know, even if it's, oh, this is a silly idea. You know, let's say it, it helps three people. And then, you know, and those people are, you know, and again, it, it's a, it's this thing where it's so tempting to think that, the, oh, you know, these things are cliches and, you know, this idea, you know, it's a ripple in the pond. They're real, they're real. You know, so, you know, just uh, maybe reaching out to your constituency, like, hey, membership, uh, we're, you know, we're brainstorming ideas, you know, so I, I don't know how many members you have, but, you know, mass email or, or mailing, you know, some of your members probably don't even know, you know, um, uh, yeah. just to, to solicit ideas. Yeah. Touching matters, huh? 
physical touching matters? It, it does. It does indeed. Yeah, yeah. You know that. Oh, so many uh, physiological things happen. You know, with, with with contact, and and this is a, yeah, and this is something that really kind of breaks my heart. Um, with the COVID situation, I, I have a, a friend back near Canton. Um, he's a, a 80, 80 plus, 81 something, uh, almost blind. He lost his ability to drive, lived alone, like you said. And um, he was my neighbor, you know, there for, for 15 years. You know, um, and I go by his house sometimes, you know, the times I'm in the US, but I'm afraid. <laughs> I've been to the US like, what, three times since we bought that. I want to stop, but I, I just, I don't want to be the guy that makes him sick, you know, <laughs> I, I, and, and ends his life, you know, but it breaks my heart to think of him there alone. You know, he has sons, two sons that stop over, but, you know, do you hug? Yeah, it's important. I mean, I feel blessed that I, uh, I, have, a, I have a wonderful partner, my wife. Um, I have actually seen my daughter uh, three times in, in the la since the lockdown. We haven't hugged, and, and it's just so hard. I think it may be a, you know, um, it's okay for people to just choose like, hey, let's be a, you know, let's be a household. I, I think that that's a legitimate thing. You know, if, if you get a few people unrelated, let's say, but, you know, let's, let's form a household of two or three or something. And, um, you know, if, if you're in a, a you know, a, a high risk group, you know, for COVID, you know, that may, maybe that's a kind of tough decision. Um, you know, if, if you're the only high risk person in this uh, household and you have the most uh, make two risk, but, but again, it's, um, yeah, this is our, this is our animal life. Uh, you know, we, need, we need the company, we, we need touch, uh, we need to play, we need to be, you know, and we need to be able to express ourselves. Yeah. I'm always trying to tell people don't, don't underestimate yourself. Don't, you know, I mean, the Wiley asked, you know, something about me being a naturalist. Everyone, you know, 40% of the time, at least, uh, new infestations of uh, invasive species are found by the folks that notice it and go, I wonder if this is that thing I heard about now, or it couldn't be, you know, who am I to say, you know, but um, yeah, the, uh, the, the speed of light was calculated by, I forget who, but for, for generations or whatever, it was, it was like, that was gospel. And then some undergraduate figured, hey, I think this is wrong. Kind of wrong. Who knew, you know, but you, you know, don't even maybe not second guess ourselves so much. Sorry. I have one last question for me anyway. Is, could, could, could you put a list together of a few of your favorite books that, that have been the most impactful and help us spread that and we'll help spread that around to uh, our membership and, and get them to uh, you know, get some benefit as well that the people that couldn't be here tonight for one reason or another? I'd be happy to. Yeah. Th yeah. Thank you. I would be happy to. I'll, um, I'll put some thought into it over the next few days just so I don't, you know, that'd be good. Something and, uh, and get that to you. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that would be wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. Oh, this is, <laughs> this is Wiley. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I'm getting an internet connection, unstable message. Uh, but uh, I can't think, normally when we come together to hear somebody present on Thursday nights during the summer, it's very focused toward the, the animal and the natural world. And uh, this uh, couldn't have been more fitting in a time when we're examining our own social needs uh, through the lockdown uh, that we all can relate to. Uh, my, uh, I'll give everybody a little backstory. Uh, we originally had contacted Paul, and, and he was going to do a talk tonight on Lyme disease. Uh, but <laughs> Heidi and I, uh, one of our staff meetings, we said, "Stop! This does not make this will not make us feel any better. Uh, let's postpone the Lyme disease talk, uh, maybe until next summer." Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, we got with uh, with Paul and determined that uh, this would be a better uh, a better course uh, due to our own situation. So Paul, masterfully done. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really enjoyed the, the presentation tonight. Great, very enjoyable. Good call on the line to you guys. Good call. <laughs>
<laughs> and, and I'd also say that as we examine our own need for social interaction, that uh, when, when, when things open up and times are better, that uh, volunteering uh, with the nonprofit, especially the, the IRLC, is a great opportunity to uh, <laughs> help those so social connections. So we hope to see all of you. Uh, thanks all for coming. Uh, Paul, I'll turn it over to you for uh, one last thought or comment before we sign off. Nothing further, Wiley. Thank you. And it's, uh, again, I always, it's a pleasure and a privilege to, uh, to be with all of you uh, this evening. And uh, yeah, Sugman Jone, as they say. Sugman, Swally, Swally, sorry. Great. <laughs> Till next time, then. We'll see you. We'll see you down here sometime, hopefully. I look forward to it. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Have a Bye, great everyone. night. Thank you. you, too, you Thanks, too. everybody. Thanks, Bye. Wiley. Bye.